maybe if you're a skeptic or maybe you're really not tuned in 100% why I'm so zealous over this thing, is I want you to understand it's reasonable to be. Uh, God gave us a brain and he gave us a noggin and, and he gives us, the, even in this passage that I just read, he gives us some keys to begin to really examine the evidence so that we can be convinced. Because the last thing that God needs is a bunch of people running around believing what I say. What, what God really needs is people who believe his word. As a matter of fact, you can't get saved if you're trusting in a man or you're trusting in a, in a work, right? You've got to be saved. You've got to trust Jesus Christ. His very name is the word of God. And so he gives us some things to look at right here in this chapter. If you look here in uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 6, he says, And uh, after this he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. You see, there were a lot of witnesses. There were a lot of people in that first century. This is written around 54 AD. That could have testified firsthand that Jesus Christ was alive. 500 folk, that's quite a few witnesses. Uh, but not only that, I think before you get caught up in all of that, the thing that I would look at first is, is what, the, what the Word of God says. That, that Jesus Christ, he, it says that he died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he, he also, in verse 4, that, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so we know that the resurrection is, a re is reasonable because of the witness of Scripture. Before we run off and talk to people, let's, what does God's word say about this? What does the Bible say? And why is that important? Because you have a book here that was compiled over thousands, a few thousand years with, with uh, over 40 different authors. But it all goes together seamlessly. The best evidence of God's uh, mind is, is found in this book. People who like to make fun of it probably have never read it thoroughly. And they, and they really, uh, some of the weak arguments that, that come against it are just silliness. When you take the Bible and you take it as what it is, it's incredible. And that is where we find our first piece of evidence. According to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. When God repeats himself, by the way, it's important. Just like you do, right? You don't want to tell, hey, if I have to say that again, right? So he tells them twice. It's important. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, it's according to the scriptures. Jesus' sac sacrificial death has been recorded in the Old Testament scriptures in type and, uh, and, and, and also prophetically, since the opening pages of the Bible. And in Adam, the Bible says, all die, in verse 22 of this same chapter. But in Christ, all shall be made alive. So we see in a type of blood sacrifice and of innocence in Genesis 3.21. We're not going to turn back there this morning for time's sake. But even in the garden, from the first time that Adam and Eve, uh, they, they sin and humanity is, goes into uh, this funk that we call depravity. Uh, we see that, that God brings forth Adam and Eve in the garden after they acknowledge sin, uh, and, and he calls them out, calls after them. And as they're dealing with sin, in verse 22 of Genesis 3, something innocent dies to cover their nakedness. That doesn't cleanse them because it's not the blood of the Lord Jesus. But we even see in type from the beginning that there must be a sacrifice for sin. And as the Bible story continues to unfold, uh, this becomes even increasingly more accurate. In the, in later, in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 46, in Numbers 9, 12, and incredible prophecies come forth uh, that are built into the pages of Scripture through the Passover feast. And if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about the Passover feast. We even referenced some of the passages in, in the, the book of Exodus chapter 12. And we talked about how in the same book of Corinthians, Paul said, Jesus Christ is our Passover. But I want you to note some things in Exodus 12, just a little pieces of evidence Exodus 12, 46 is one of those. It says, in, a, in one house shall it be eaten, speaking of the Passover. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. God was very careful uh, when he was telling the children of Israel, when you prepare this Passover feast, this lamb, right, uh, which is a representation of, uh, of what happened in the wilderness when uh, the children of Israel, before they, they exited, they killed this lamb. They put the blood over the doorpost and the death angel passed over them. Make sure that lamb that is prepared does not have a bone broken. Make sure he doesn't have a bone broken. Now, that may not seem like a big deal uh, at the time. It's okay. It's what God says. But ultimately, what that's doing is pointing forth to the lamb of God. It was traditional in Roman times uh, that you would break and even crush the shins of those that were on the cross. Because as they hung upon the cross, it was only the ability to lift up, get a little breath, and die, or, and then, then drop down. 
they would do that until they got so tired that once they couldn't lift anymore, their lungs would fill with carbon dioxide, and they'd just basically suffocate. It would be a slow, grueling death. So typically, that's why the, the Roman soldiers went out fanned to bust the, the legs and break the legs of those guys on the cross, and they found Jesus is already dead. Why? Well, not only is it because he took the sins of the world on his shoulders in that three-hour time on the cross, but it's also probably because his organs were hanging, and you can see right through his ribcage because they beat him so profusely before he even got there. Uh, he was in bad shape from a human point of view. But it, you know what? You had to do that because he was the God man. He was one tall hombre, I guarantee you. It was hard to kill him. But you know what? That's not what put him down. What put him down was our sin. And it was the sacrifice that he, he, he uh, gave for us. And uh, I tell you what, it was a brutal thing. Uh, people, I remember when the Passion of the Christ came out and everybody's like, oh gosh, it's horrible. Guys, it probably wasn't even accurate. It might have been worse. Could have been worse. But God gears before us and says, hey, you know what? Make sure when that lamb goes to the cross, he doesn't have a bone broke. Well, he was beaten and he was battered. He was bruised beyond recognition. His skin was laid open. They didn't have to break his legs. Numbers 9, verse 11. I'm putting these up today just to save time. The 14th day of the second month at the, at the even, the evening, then they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave uh, none of it until the morning, nor break any bone of it. Remember, they had to take him down. Why? Because it was the, the Passover. Don't break his bones. Get him off there. Took him down off the cross. John 19, 36. For these <clears throat> things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him should not be broken. And that's just a small example. When you go through the scriptures, you find that everything that happened to Jesus Christ was ordained of God. It was written of God. It was already and it was already contained in the scriptures. Now you tell me, how do you coordinate that among the Romans, the Jews, and everybody that was involved in that thing, and those disciples who most of them were running off scared anyway, except for the Apostle John? You couldn't coordinate that. God did that in His in His sovereignty and His providence. There are many more scriptures which detail the death of Christ, but none so accurate as Psalm 22. It's in Psalm 22 that we have the very thoughts of Christ while he hangs suffering on the cross. The verse screams, uh, the verse, I'm sorry, screams a prophecy, right, from the mind of God. When he, it starts off in Psalm 22, when he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then you get a, mind's, a, 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 a God's eye view of what Jesus was thinking as he's hanging on the cross. It's an incredible prophecy. We don't have time to even look at it this morning. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my mind? Every soul must be, uh, you need to think about that. For those of us that are saved, we know the answer, don't we? We know why. Because of our sin. Because of my sin. That's why God was so far from helping. Maybe you haven't contemplated that before. Maybe you've really never taken the time to really think about, what if this story was really true? What if these events unfolded just as they were written? What if this book is, a, is truly a holy book? It's truly God's word to man. What if it's mathematically impossible to see this thing fulfilled? And yet it was fulfilled just as it is written. Why did he say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was it just for the sins of the world? Yeah, it was for the sins of the world, but it was for, it was for your sin. It's for my sin. That makes all the difference in the world. Knowing that Jesus personally died for you. You know, it's often said if there was only one, if you would have been the only person, right, that would receive Christ, Jesus would have died for you. Or if you were the only person that would get saved, Jesus would have died for you. Hey, that's the kind of love that he has. The reason we even value life in our culture, we used to value life in our culture, is because the very basic uh, essence of who God is, that he took people that were not worthy of redeeming and he gave them value by giving the most valuable thing. God gave the most valuable thing he had. The reason we're valuable is because of Jesus. You look at some old person and you judge them and you put yourself above them to make yourself feel better. Hey, listen, you've made a mistake. Jesus is dying for everybody. They are valuable because God loves them. That's why we're valuable. And those are things that we have to get straight in our mind, especially those of us who are born again. And so there are many passages in the Old Testament scriptures that give evidence of the witness of scripture to the resurrection uh, as well. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 19, 
The passage says, Thy dead man shall live together with thy dead body. They shall arise, awake, and sing. Ye shall dwell in the dust, for the dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into the chambers, and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. That passage speaks of a resurrection. That passage speaks of what Jesus Christ uh, suffered. He suffered on the cross so that we would be resurrected someday. See, the resurrection is not just about Jesus, but it's about us. This reminds us of the of the, uh, the, and the us born again believers in the New Testament, the promises of Colossians three three. The Bible says in Colossians three and verse three, "For ye are dead, and your life is is hid. It's hid in Christ. It's hid in God." Hey, this morning, if you're born again, God has hid you. He's hid you from his indignation. Why? Because Jesus Christ has already taken it. The wrath of God has been, that you deserve has already been placed on his son. And your life is now hid in Christ. And that's something to rejoice over on Easter morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ezekiel 37 verse 12 says, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves, and I will cause you to come out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O oh, my people, and brought you up out of the graves. And can you say that enough? Uh, <clears throat> and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Now that's a prophecy toward Israel of Ezekiel 37, and it will come to pass. There is a resurrection of dead people, and Jesus Christ is a promise. The first fruits of the dead is Jesus Christ himself. So this reminds us of the New Testament verses. One of my favorites is 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Well, how can someone get out of the grave? Well, the same way that you get saved, by faith. You put your faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago, and he saved you. Not just to change your circumstances today. You become a change agent because Jesus Christ is in you. But because someday he's going to open the grave if you die before his return, and he literally will resurrect you. Well, how's he going to do that? Hey, listen. Uh, leave that to him. He knows how to overcome death. He's the only one who can. We can even see from Job that our resurrection is not possible without Christ's resurrection. In Job 19 and verse 25, the Bible says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, that's very important, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin, uh, my skin worms destroy this body, yet shall my flesh, in my flesh shall I see God. You know what Job was promising there? He's saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what happens in death. There will be a day when I stand with my Redeemer, and I will get a new body. He goes on to say, Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and no other, uh, though my reins be consumed within me. Beloved, that's a beautiful thing. There's some of us even uh, today that have just uh, experienced the, the loss, right, uh, of death. Uh, Jack and Cheryl, they, their neighbor just passed away unexpectedly. Uh, uh, Peggy and um, <clears throat> Shirley. Uh, they, they just lost their sister last night. Uh, there's uh, In all these cases, the people were born again believers. And so even though uh, this life ends abruptly sometimes, Joe Sparks just lost his son-in-law uh, this last Thursday. Death is with us all the time. Death is with us all the time. You know, we just kind of try to ignore it sometimes, like it's not going to happen to, to us. Hey, it's coming. I pray that you have the faith that Job had, that you know no matter what comes of this body, that your Redeemer liveth. Uh, he was crucified, yeah, but he died, yeah, but he rose again the third day. And because he's alive, if you put your faith in him, you'll be alive. And that's what the Bible teaches. And it's been recorded in the scriptures. If Jesus would have <clears throat> not have resurrected from the dead, there'd be no hope after the grave. Jesus himself told the Pharisees that the sign that he would give them would be the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah brought a dire message of repentance to Nineveh, so rejecting Jesus bears with it a heavy cost. Not believing and receiving holds various serious consequences. In Matthew chapter 12, and verse 38, the Bible says, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees were teachers, they were religious men of that day, they answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. You know, continue to show us more reasons, give us more evidence, more evidence, more evidence. We, we still are convinced, we're still not convinced. Jesus says, I'll give you a sign, all right? But he answering said of them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart.
of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at, at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. You see, what you do with the death, the burial, and resurrection is really important. The only thing that Jesus wanted those Pharisees and Sadducees to understand is that they would be responsible for his death. Now, it wasn't just because they were Jews and they took the money and all that stuff from, hey, the Romans were part of it, but you know what? It ultimately happened because I was part of it. And it's that personal aspect that we take responsibility that really sets us free when we understand that even though we were responsible for that death, we really couldn't do it. Jesus is the one that allowed it. How do you kill God? You don't, unless he lays his life down. You can't really do that. As grievous as your sin is, that, that isn't going to do it. He has to allow himself to be your sacrifice for sin, and he did. And the only explanation for that is because he loves you. He loves you. Even while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. We know the resurrection is reality because of the witness of Scripture. Okay, that's the first thing. The Scripture itself bears witness. Uh, prophecies that were of old, and I'm just touching on a few of them, have been laid out from the Bible, from the Old Testament throughout. And guys, they are fulfilled to the T because this book is perfect. It's holy, and God has blessed it. But we also know the resurrection is reasonable because of those eyewitnesses that I've already mentioned. About 500 brethren at once. I mean, that's a lot of people. At once. You can't have a group. It don't matter how many mushrooms are there. There is not a group hallucination that's that big. And you, think, and you laugh. You know what? Well, there's there's, there's uh, people who try to, to, to blow this off as some sort of hallucination. I'm like, that's some sort of trip. There's no way medically that's even possible. I'll tell you what. This is compelling evidence even for the, the biggest skeptic. And in a court of law, eyewitness testimony is very powerful. Uh, I brought up the name of Sir Lionel Lucku uh, before in previous sermons concerning the resurrection. Sir Lionel is the world's, world's most successful lawyer, trying 245 murder cases or appeals, uh, and they were all acquitted in his career as an attorney, which ended in 1985. He was uh, knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth and is known for being one of the best lawyers ever. And his life story is very interesting as he was... Uh, he was a guy that, that was an indentured servant, servant out of India, and, uh, and he bought himself working. Uh, he bought himself out of slavery and worked his way on up, was studying to be a doctor, uh, and ended up becoming a, uh, a lawyer because he couldn't stand the sight of blood. He's an interesting character. But later in life, he, he trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. One of the reasons uh, that Sir Lionel Lucku became a Christian was because of the evidence. He put Jesus Christ, he put the scriptures on trial. And just the, like many before him and many after him, he, he ended up figuring out that truly what the Bible says is true. He just uses his intellect and uses the same principles that we use in daily life. And I have a quote here from uh, Sir Lionel. He said, I say unequivocally that the evidence uh, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. No doubt of the resurrection. Jesus faced doubt from his own disciples, but, <clears throat> but hands-on evidence was ultimately enough to convince them. You're like, hey, that's me. I'm like Thomas. I want to see it. I want to see it. Well, hey, good. I'm glad you do. If you do, this is what I'd recommend you do. You open up this book and you start looking at it. Right. It's called the Word of God. John had a sticker. Uh, John, down in Thomas, he put his fingers in the Word of God. It was a physical body, but nonetheless, and he saw it. He, and he said, my Lord, my God. You start taking this book seriously. You take the time to start reading it, trying to, to, to uh, understand it. I tell you what, it will speak to you. It will show you who Jesus Christ is. <laughs> Paul's writing a little over 20 years after the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. Telling his audience that they can still interview. Almost 500. And some of them have fallen asleep. Being, some of them have died. But he's, he's even, even that many years after the resurrection, he says you can still go talk to those people. I got to thinking about that. If you had to depose 500 witnesses and you only did like eight hours a day because you had other things to do, it'd take you a month. It'd take you 30 days if you did it for eight hours a day. Can you imagine? Eight hours a day, listen to one testimony after the next testimony, after the next testimony, after the next testimony, after the next testimony, after the next testimony. After the next testimony. Guys, that just doesn't happen. Paul used that. He threw that out there. He says, hey, there's enough eyewitnesses. If you, don't doubt, if you doubt the resurrection, go talk to them. At that time, they could have done that. Examine the eyewitness evidence. When Jesus was yielding up the ghost, the earthquake, 
the temple rent from the top to bottom. The Roman centurions believed that truly Jesus was the Son of God. The Apostle John saw the blood and the water come out of the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples were in the upper room with Jesus after that. The disciples were with Jesus in Galilee after that. The disciples uh, of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> not just the twelve, were with him for, for 40 days before his ascension. There were a lot of people that Jesus appeared to. The disciples stood in, uh, with Jesus as he ascended up in the clouds in Acts 1.8. Getting 500 people to agree on a lie would be impossible. However, getting 500 people to testify that they saw a man living among them is impossible to refute. Paul, giving his eyewitness testimony to King Agrippa, points out the public nature of the ministry and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 26, he says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I speak freely. Paul, giving the gospel, how he came to know Jesus Christ himself. And he says, For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was done, not was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, <coughs> only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether, such as I am, except these bonds. Do you realize the men that believed the Lord Jesus Christ was alive and proclaimed that? Pretty much knew they had a death sentence. Every one of those men died. They didn't die for something they didn't believe. I guarantee you that. I wish I had time to go through the different ways they died. From being sawn asunder, to being thrust through with swords, to being speared, uh, to uh, being hung, um, you know, being crucified upside down. I mean, just, just name it. Uh, they went through it. They tried to kill the Apostle John by boiling him. Couldn't get it done. God protected him. But, but they tried all but one of them was, uh, and, and, and uh, many of them outside of the, the initial 12, and the Apostle Paul also uh, faced similar deaths. Why? Because it was all fictitious? No. Because it's a reality. There's a hope that goes beyond the grave. Not even the king could deny the plausibility of the, of the impossible. If you believe that Jesus overcame death, you have to acknowledge he is God, because only God can overcome death. And Paul presents his claims as reasonable to anyone who understands anything about the Scripture. However, Paul doesn't appeal to Scripture. He appeals to history to make his point because it was so, so well known at that time. So even Jesus' enemy didn't deny the empty tomb. So why would you? They simply tried to cover it up. Even the enemies of Jesus couldn't deny that he wasn't in the tomb. In Matthew 28, in verse 12, the Bible says, And when they were assembled with the elders and had and, uh, and taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying commonly is recorded among the Jews until this day. You see, the reason they had to cover up the resurrection is because it was real. It, they, there was no one in the tomb because Jesus Christ is alive. The elders of Israel didn't deny the tomb was empty. In fact, they spent their time and money trying to cover up that fact. And beloved, there are people today, uh, 2,000 years later, who spend their time and their money trying to cover up the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. They'll go, they'll go search long and hard to find reason to try to cover up the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So it's not, it's not unreasonable to believe in the resurrection. It's unreasonable when you try that hard to cover up a fact that happened 2,000 years ago. If something's still hanging around after 2,000 years, I suspect you better look into why. It could be true. Secondly, the resurrection is not only reasonable, but it's real. It's a reality. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to just skip down to verse 12. And uh, I just want to touch on a couple of verses here. Uh, verse 12 says, <clears throat> Now Christ be preached that he rose from the dead. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and our faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be, that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which have fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. You may say, Brian, I find the resurrection to be reasonable. Great. Well, do you find the resurrection to be real? 
is it relevant in your life? It doesn't have an impact in your life. If the resurrection is not real in your life, then you're taking the biggest risk you could ever take in eternity. If you don't see what makes the resurrection reasonable and relevant to your life, then the Bible is very clear that you are lost. Because that's the one thing that God wants us to understand is the importance of his son and why he died on the cross. If the resurrection is not real, then we have real problems. Now, if you're around Christians very long, you're going to realize that Christians have real problems, right? They're just folks, and they got skin on. What makes us different is we have hope. That's the difference. We have hope that when we die, we will be changed. We have hope that when we walk in the Spirit, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We have hope that not only will God cover our sins, man, and He'll give us the grace to go forward over our sins and walk in the, in, in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So God is awesome. He conquers sin. He, he saves us. He sets us apart. If Christ is not raised, then you won't be either. That's what it says in verses 12 through 13. If Christ is not raised, then I'm wasting my life as a preacher, man. I need to go do something more profitable. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14, Paul says, man, this is a waste of time. This is a waste of time to preach Jesus if he's not alive this morning. If Christ is not raised, then your faith is in vain. You're wasting your time this morning. Now, eat, drink, and be merry because you will die tomorrow. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ be not raised, uh, <clears throat> then uh, all men like me across the planet this morning that are preaching the Lord Jesus Christ is alive. You know what Paul says? Then we are false witnesses. You know what false witnesses are? They're people who don't who lie about the things of God. The Apostle Paul thought that the gospel was a message coming out of false witnesses, and he dedicated his life to finding people who would dare speak on behalf of God a lie and was going to exterminate them. That was what he was doing before he met Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul knew very well when he said false witness what he meant. This is if this is not true, man, then these people were worthy of death. This is heresy. But the reality is it is true. It is true. It's a very strong condemnation if it's not. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 18, the, the, the Bible says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. There was a death penalty in the nation of Israel to the prophet. They would say, thus saith the Lord, and just make up a story. He said, that prophet will die. Remember what happened to Balaam and Balak? Eventually, he met his death. He, he couldn't curse Israel, but he taught how to deceive them. Eventually, he ended up dying with his money. And so the, the reality is this. Hey, guys, listen, there's a lot of people today who say a lot of things on behalf of God. But there's no way to really know what God says unless you get it from his word. That's why if you, if you want to be a preacher, you want to be a prophet, don't, there really aren't, don't be a prophet. Be a preacher. Uh, the gift is over. The Bible's been fulfilled. And so, but if you want to speak on behalf of God, this is what you want to speak. You want to speak his word. And you want to do that rightly divided. Because there's a great, there's a, there's a, there's a, a intense penalty if you do not. Now the reality is Paul says, listen, if this message we preach is false, then so are we. And he, when he said that, what he meant was, that's worthy of death. That's worthy of being a false prophet, Deuteronomy chapter 18. If Christ is not raised, then we are, are still in our sin. There's no advocate, right? There's no one to stand before you in heaven before the Holy Father and say, why should I not put him out of his misery? Jesus Christ says, because I've already paid. Hey, if you don't believe Jesus resurrected from the dead, you have no advocate. All, the, all you can look forward to is the wrath of God. There is no advocate. There's no propitiation. There's no atonement for your sin if Jesus Christ did not rise from the grave. If Christ raised not, then you're absolute, there's absolutely no hope of being reunited with your family and friends after your death. That's what verse 18 says. There's just no hope. No hope. If Christ be not raised, then Christians above all have the most miserable existence. That's what he says in verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Why suffer? Why go through it? Because Jesus Christ is worthy. If Christ is not raised, then Christians above all have the most miserable existence. But the reality of resurrection is available. And it's not just available after you get out of the grave. It's available now. Look at verse 20. He says, but now. I just want to pause there. But now. But now is Christ risen from the dead. But now. He is alive right now. 
and become the first fruits of them that slept. You know what? Paul doesn't mince words. Now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits. He is alive. Everyone alive at that time was a witness to that. They were giving up their lives. It could not be denied. This morning, do you really grasp the reality that Jesus Christ, he's, not, he's alive. He's in our midst. Our whole life exists for him. Or does it? You know what happens is the devil beguiles us, even those of us that are saved, and we forget the importance of the resurrection and the reality of that. The curse is reversed. When you look at verse 21, it goes on to say, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first roots after the day that of Christ at his coming. Man, there's hope. The hope of the resurrection. The curse is reversed, and the last Adam is taken care of. The reality of the resurrection assures our resurrection with Christ this morning. So the resurrection is reasonable, it's real, and at the end of the day, there's a reward. Just look to the last part of the book. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look down in verse, uh, verse 53. Verse 52. There's a mystery that Paul's giving to the church. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this uh, <clears throat> and have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, saying that the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. I love this in verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That one word through is so important. Man, so many times in this life we try to go about trying to get victory. And we try to do it so many different ways, right? There's so many different avenues. There's so many different options. And we forget that the only way to have victory is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way to have victory. He says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for, message, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know what? Your life isn't empty when you put your faith in Christ. I tell you what, it's really not fulfilled until you do that. You know, I remember what it was like before I knew Jesus. And, and I tell you, you would have, if you're like I was, you would have goals, you would aspire to certain things. And you were just sure that if you attain this certain goal, man, that's going to get it done. Then I'll feel satisfied. And so you get this goal, and you get that goal, you get the other goal. And you know what ends up happening? Once you get there, it's in vain, isn't it? It's empty. And you're like, man, I thought, I thought for sure uh, doing this, with the, accomplishing this, getting this reward, uh, getting this job, getting this position, getting this degree... Uh, none of those things, by the way, that I talk about the good things of life. I'm not talking about bad things. Some of you get to, get to the point where you give up hope. You're like, you know what, man? I, I'm to the place where I know uh, none of that's, I can't even attain that. The devil's already got a hold on you. You just quit. You're like, all right, I'm going to medicate now. I figured out that I can't get any satisfaction here. I can't get any satisfaction there. Just give me a pill. Give me a drink. Man, give me a shot. Just give me something, man. Just let me check out for a little while. Just get through this thing. And then you go on autopilot. Right? Why? To numb the pain. To numb the pain. And then you know what happens then, right? The old physiological problems kick in. And then your body wants, what, more and more and more and more. Some of you are that way. Some of you, there's all kinds of different tricks. I don't want to get into every one. I can't even name them. The devil, you know, God's got a wrench to fit every nut, and so does the devil, right? And so what you got to have is make a decision. Are you going to live in vain? Because I tell you what, if Jesus Christ isn't your medication, you got the, you got the wrong solution. Your life is in vain. If you're not medicating with Jesus, I guarantee you, you will never be satisfied. You will never get what you need in your soul. And the resurrection is real. It's real. It's real practical, too. He goes through in this same chapter. He says, uh, some say, well, how did the dead raise? Hey, don't you know that you got to stick a kernel in the ground? A seed that's dead, you stick it in the ground, not to produce more seeds, what, but to produce a, a plant, a tree. 
Do you, know, do you realize the glory of the resurrection? What God has for you when you put your faith in him is so much superior to this old carnal carcass, this old carnal. And this carnal that you are walking around in is worthless compared to what God has for you in the resurrection. We look forward to We look forward to This is crazy. I know this is the way Paul talked too. We look forward to death. Why? Because it gives us the promise of a new body, a new creature in Christ Jesus. We already know that's who we are on the inside. But you know what death does for us? It frees us from this carcass. And we, by faith, understand that God has a much better body for us, a glorified body. And guys, that's what makes your life whole. If you're really a believer, if you really understand what the Bible's talking about, that's why he talks about different magnifications in glory. Some are like the stars, right? Some are like the moon. Some are like the sun. Jesus Christ himself is the son of righteousness. There's different magnitudes of glory. Why? Because there are people on this earth who not only believe that Jesus is alive, but they live every day of their life looking forward past this life into eternity, understanding that, that serving Christ today will have eternal dividends. And those dividends are going to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ himself because they figured out in time what was important for eternity. And they gave their life for that and they invested that and that's the seed they planted. Beloved, don't kid yourself. When you come up out of that grave, it will be manifest. That's the truth of God's word. And that's why it's so important that we understand this whole resurrection thing. It's our reward. It's our reward. It's not just reasonable. And it's not just a reality. Listen, beloved, it's what we cling to because it is the only thing worth investing in. If it wasn't, I'd be off doing project management somewhere. Putting up Things that are going to be torn down and rebuilt again and torn down. How many, I remember when I was working for Fagan, I'm like, I'm so excited at first, it's cool, hands on, you know, you get the stuff, it's cool to see it going in and see it. Okay, that was cool the first time, the first year, then for 10 years later. Hey, they, I, I remember when we did that, now we've torn it out three more times and redid it again. It just becomes a grind. You know what? You know what got me through that disappointment? The reality of the resurrection. And I'm like, yes, yeah, Lord, this is all going to burn someday. I'm glad my heart is not wrapped up in the things that I make with my hands. Amen. You know what my heart, my, you know what God wants your heart, my heart to be wrapped in? The things that he's made with his hands, the souls of men. Breathe into their nostrils the breath of life and they become a living soul. That's what God's heart's wrapped up in. The souls of men and women. He wants us to invest the word of God. Because it has eternal dividends. Hope in the resurrection is promise. It's promise. Man, that your life is not in vain. That's why the Apostle Paul preached. That's why those guys died. Not just because it was reasonable. Not just because it was real. But because they really, really, really believed that the Jesus Christ could live with them. Hey, is he yours this morning? Maybe you're too long away from life. Man, it's vain. It's empty. You know what I'm, you know I'm telling you the truth because you're living it. You don't have to be here very long to get that thing figured out. So how are you going to medicate? Are you just going to get through life? Looking for retirement? Hey, go talk to some of these retired folks, right? About the time you get there. Oh. Wow. I thought I was going to be playing tennis, man. <laughs> I used to think that. I started down here at 30 years old, 32 years old. And I thought I had this view of, of retirement for some reason at that time. And then the more I got to know some of my senior saint friends, the more I realized, man, life doesn't get any easier. It just gets harder. You know, I thought that. I thought, oh, man, you get a life. Man, you got that place where it just gets easier. And it just gets easier, you know? Because you got a mess day. Uh -uh. No, it doesn't get, doesn't get easier. So how is it that some of those senior saints just seem to smile and have joy? Knowing their bodies are falling apart? The retirement plan values just like been cut in half the last 10 years. They can't afford a lake house. What? Oh, I know. It's the joy of the resurrection. Amen. They got a better retirement plan. Man, I like being around them because it gives me hope. And it helps me realize what I need to be investing in. So my life is not in vain. I pray your life is not in vain because let me tell you something. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a message. It's not empty. The things that I tell you guys are true. Do 
you need to examine the evidence. If you're still doubting, man, I, I pray that you would you would do the do the investigation yourself. Because God will prove himself to you. He loves you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for this time to just focus.